as I think about skill limitations for the CrossFit athletes, there's sort of three different demographics of athlete that come to, to my mind. First is the person who's still learning all the skills that are required that are, again, typically tested in the in sort of like the normal testing body um, in like a, a quarterfinal style test or like a, a decent local competition maybe, right? Where it's like double unders, handstand push-ups, handstand walk, toes to bar, chest to bar, muscle ups, handstand walking, right? Some of those, I won't call them basic skills, but for the competitive athlete, there are sort of the fundamentals. So the basics in that sense, where skill work for that more beginner athlete or someone who's still learning those skills, it's going to be largely centered around those things because that's what's going to be necessary in order for them to be able to compete and to be able to ultimately kind of build and layer on capacity into those things. Because those are often tested in sort of a capacity based approach, even though they're skills, no different than like toes to bar and shoulder to overhead. Again, most people are thinking that as maybe an engine workout, but if you don't have those techniques refined, you're not going to be able to express your engine. So it's a very similar thing for that type of athlete. Now, if we go to the other end of the spectrum and we have like a, a games level athlete, who's a professional and what they do, they are going to be having a whole number of things that they're asked to do that are outside the normal testing body of the sport because they are a spectacle. So if somebody goes to CrossFit games or they go to the rogue invitational, they can expect to see a completely different battery of uh, tests and exercises and novel implements and all these unique things that they're going to be asked to do because they are basically put on like they're part of the show essentially. So for them, it's even in semifinals and like uh, higher level competitions that are like cross licensed event and things like that, they're just like more professionally run. You're going to see more and more of that where we're having, you know, novel formats, novel implements, right? Like somebody like a rogue fitness, could they have the capability of like making their own equipment and like having all this unique things that, that appear like peg boards the first time they appeared, like the pig, like those circus dumbbells, like there's a million different things that they could use. And therefore the games athlete needs to be prepared for that. And since it's part of their testing body, they need to be brushing up on all these different skills, a lot more inversion work, right? Handstand ramps, all of that sort of stuff. So they're sort of on the other end of the spectrum. And for me, I feel like perhaps I've neglected the athlete a bit in terms of a skill development perspective in the past. And I think this is a, because they're, they do sort of sit in the middle where they have the, the techniques. They're pretty clean. We might be doing some things like drills, technique work on fatigue practice of those things to continue to clean up the movements themselves, like working on, you know, handstand walk body line drills and making sure that, uh, the chest bars is as fluid and as, uh, you know, clean and as efficient as possible, but not doing a lot of developmental skill work because, they are relatively unlikely to be tested on that sort of thing. And now that's sort of shifted a little bit with uh, Bosman at the helm, he seems to be pushing a lot more of the skills forward and having a little bit more novelty in the programming, especially in the 2022 season, we saw that. So that's one of the reasons why I've started to change my mind on this a bit. It's not just like I've, oh, I think this is a good idea. It's more so reflective of changes in the programming style and who is actually in charge of that. And I know it might be a little bit more collaborative at the moment between Bosman and Castro. However, we don't exactly know the dynamics of that. And we certainly know that Adrian Bosman has a hand on it. So likely we're going to continue to see the envelope get pushed in certain ways. And that's something that will have a trickle down effect to that sort of semifinal bubble to open bubble level athlete. So how I thought about it kind of historically up till maybe this previous season was Statistically speaking, what are the athletes most likely to see from a skill-based training perspective, right? And you're going to train them on those things. And now that's still the case. However, what is shifting is we're, we're now having more and more of these novel movements that are pulled in. And the, the stats are now saying, okay, it probably makes more sense to train things that um, could potentially come out that maybe haven't yet. And developing those ability levels for all three of those different levels of athlete is what I really want to discuss today and how I think about building athleticism with a skill-limited CrossFit athlete. The Fitness Movement is brought to you by Zor Fitness. 
We offer coaching and individualized program design, as well as educational content for coaches and athletes. It's all at one place, sewerfitness.com. Today's show, I'm actually going to break into two different episodes. The first episode, I'm going to be covering why I'm talking about this. Like, why does the skill limitations, like, why does that really matter? And why am I covering it now? I want to define athleticism, how I'm thinking about it in the context of the competitive crossfit athlete. And then I want to kind of go through two different stages of learning, motor learning, some of the principles behind that, and basically taking through somebody from what's going to allow for initial success in learning a movement and then transferring that and moving it into um, what does mastering efficiency in a movement for the sport of CrossFit matter? Because again, you could probably take that a number of different places, but for the CrossFit athlete, efficiency is always the most important thing because again, a lot of these things are going to be tested in capacity formats where you're going to get more volume and with more volume means that the cost per rep or cost per contraction of whatever you're doing needs to be driven down. And the only way to do that is through improving the efficiency and the economy of the movement. So that's the first episode, the principles behind it. The second one, I want to go over more uh, programming. So I actually want to pull a lot of specific examples. So basically, like what's the difference between trying to predict new booms that could come out? Like, oh, will we see, um, you know, an inverted burpee or something crazy that comes out and everybody catches everybody off guard versus building athleticism in a general sense of like preparing the athlete to learn new things. So trying to predict specifics versus generally trying to raise the athlete's ceiling for quote unquote athleticism. And then I'm going to go over five skill work principles that I've been focusing on this uh, season for a lot of my athletes and what I've been thinking about. And then examples from real pro- real programming from my individual design uh, clients, my athletes, uh, as well as some of the things like the name game, as well as my own programming that I'm just going to pull. So yeah, those, those are the next two episodes. I'm going to basically release them back to back, but let's jump right into this. Like, why are we doing this and why, why the timing? Like, why are we doing this now? So personally, I feel like I fall probably like a standard deviation above the bell curve in terms of like general quote unquote, like athleticism. And that. I, I believe that is due to the fact that I don't have like some like innate giftedness or something or it, anything like that. I think it's largely just due to my, my experiences in my like developing years as an athlete, right? So like playing like just as a kid, like being in a pool, like all the time, just like swimming, climbing trees, like my family is super active. We were always like going on vacations and hiking and um, just like doing that sort of stuff, like playing at recess with my friends, like playing two hand touch football. It's like just like a very active kid. So I got a lot of different exposures to a lot of different things. Growing up and through high school, I played soccer. I did some track and field, but that was to a lesser degree. Um, And then like playing soccer though, like lots of sprinting, jumping, change of direction, like foot, eye coordination, timing, reaction time. A lot of those uh, skills are developed there. And then wrestling, obviously I did that all through college for people who've been listening to the show for any length of time. And there I was really like, maybe less in college, but like certainly in high school and middle school, like learning a lot of new techniques, like basically everything you do in wrestling, some sort of a move, right? So learning how to string those together and make those fluid and efficient. And also like just having a huge battery of things that you have to to drill on a normal basis. And that's like what a lot of, you know, wrestling practice consists of is just drilling movements. And additionally, there's like a lot of like body orientation changes. So like literally like changing the direction of your body in space, being like, aware of your body and how you are oriented in space again relative to yourself relative to an opponent um, and then also like driving up like strength to body weight ratio and for me i feel like a lot of those things did transfer fairly well for me into crossfit where fairly quickly i was able to learn a lot of the skills that a lot of other people had trouble with just because i had already done a lot of body weight training for years and years i was already pretty lean i was already pretty strong and I'll also say that like a lot of those areas are still relative strengths for me today like body weight movements like um, burpees and toes to bar and pull ups and muscle ups and all that stuff is still relative strengths for me, handstand walking, uh, as well as like a lot of the bounding movements, so, like running, double unders, box jumps, like a lot of that stuff um, is also like relative strengths. And again, for me, I feel like I'm the the athlete I mentioned that's sort of in the, in the middle where I'm, I'm not beginner, I'm not still like learning the skills of the sport that are again in the traditional testing body. And I'm also not like a games athlete where I need to be preparing for, you know, a lot of swimming and a lot of like odd object stuff that I'm going to see in in person competitions. Like I still need a lot of 
maybe not a lot, but I'm, I need to focus more of my energy towards like the qualifier style fitness. And that's where a lot of my athletes, certainly I have a, plenty of people that are um, still learning the skills, but a lot of the people, they do have those skills fairly refined or in maybe a similar boat to me where they're, you know, not at a games level yet, but they still want to be able to get to good in-person competitions and also be prepared if do, new and novel things do come out. So again, for me, I find that like, again, the skills that are traditionally tested, like double unders, muscle up, handstand walking, you know, butterfly pull-ups and all that kind of stuff. Like those are all pretty refined and pretty uh, comfortable for me. And I'm just also not that likely to see novel implements or like venues. Like again, if we go to the games athlete, they need to be prepared for the pig. They need to be prepared for a pegboard. They need to be prepared for yokes and sandbags and strawman implements. They need to be prepared for handstand walking and pirouettes and all that stuff as well as like venue shifts. So like being able to go swimming, uh, go for a ruck, having obstacle course races, cyclocross, like all the novel things that a games athlete or a high level athlete that's at a, a well-run competition that has a lot of funds could be asked to do. So again, as I mentioned before, I think it's important for all of these athletes now to be def- continuing to push and develop their skills. However, where you're at in terms of your athletic development is going to determine how much you actually, how much time and energy you put into those things. And I would say, again, you're going to put more time and energy if you're on the ends of the spectrum. If you don't have your first muscle up yet, for example, you need to be spending a lot of time working on developing the qualities and working on drills and carryover to being able to learn your first muscle up because that's going to be a huge separator and way more important than just like your general capacity. Likewise, but in a different way, like a games athlete, a really high level athlete, they need to be spending more time on developing skills because you're just likely to see more novel situations that I all described before. So the the athlete who's sort of in the middle, like me, which is why I use myself as the example, is still needs to have touches of that, but it's just going to probably be look a little bit different and be just not taking up a lot of time or not be super expensive from like an energy expenditure standpoint or like even just like mental bandwidth standpoint uh, throughout their week. And that's one of the things that I kind of go into here is like how that could look different for each of those athletes. So first, let's define athleticism. I think just generally, I think of like athleticism as your ability to learn new skills and pick them up quickly. I've said this before, but I think athleticism to me is very much like someone who can speak multiple languages. Um, someone's like multilingual, they can pick up a new language quicker than someone who only speaks a single language. So for me to pick up Spanish as an only English speaker is going to be extremely much more challenging than someone who speaks four or five different languages in Europe and they go to speak, pick up Spanish, right? They're much more likely to pick that up and they probably will pick that up much quicker because there's all these little things that other people won't even recognize. And I wouldn't recognize that they see as like similarities carry over like those sorts of qualities that allow them to pick it up a lot quicker. It's no different from an athleticism motor learning point of view in terms of if you've done, you know, handstand walking and you can do pegboards and you could do handstand walk ramps and you can do, you know, butterfly kipping ring muscle ups or something like weird, different, like stuff you've just kind of practiced over the years that like other people haven't done. If you go now go to do bar pullovers, you're going to be way better at that, right? If you've done like giant swings or something on like, uh, like you're a gymnast growing up and now you're asked to do bar pullovers, again, you're going to learn that so much quicker. So it's just just like general sort of carryover. So I, I define it more specifically for athleticism as two, two things. First would be an accelerated time to proficiency in a new skill. So let's call this initial success, right? Being able to go from zero to one of whatever it is. And then the second thing would be accelerated time to mastery of that newly acquired skill. So I call this discovering efficiency. So moving from, okay, I have never done a bar pullover to, oh, I've done a bar pullover. Okay. That's your initial success. Being consistent in the fact that, oh, I can actually do them consistently. If someone's learning how to do double unders, it's going from, I can hit one or two, one or two to three, to now I can hit, you know, sets of 25 to 30 on a regular basis if I have rest. Right. And then it becomes like, okay, now let's discover the efficiency within that. 
Again, this is super important for the CrossFit athlete. It may not be for as much for other athletes, but for CrossFit is extremely important. What can we do to clean that up and make it as efficient as possible so that the capacity and the sustainability of that movement rises? So I'm just going to pause here a second. If you're someone who's still learning a lot of the skills that I mentioned before, like double unders, muscle up, handstand walking, I would go back and listen to episode number 57. I, there I talk about basically how to master any skill within CrossFit, basically principles of motor learning. So I don't want to be redundant here and go over all that stuff again. Again, if you're someone who, uh, yeah, that stuff would be interesting or in the process of learning that still, I would go back and listen to that. Uh, Zorfitness.com slash podcast slash 057 uh, to check that out. So I want to kind of go into each one of these a little bit deeper. Again, how I'm defining athleticism part one being acquiring that new skill. So accelerated time to proficiency in a new skill. I think we probably all have some sort of experience around this where actually this was a memory of mine. I went over to a friend's house. We were jumping on his trampoline. His big brother comes over, does a backflip on the trampoline. And then like, you know, two, three minutes later, he's like, oh, I think I could do that. And he does a backflip. And you're like, okay, this kid just did a backflip in front of me. I mean, like he'd never done it before. He just attempted it and he did that. And the feeling, I'm assuming that a lot of people that walk into a CrossFit gym and they see someone doing like a muscle up have like that similar first like, oh man, where it's like, wow, that's impressive and I don't know if I can do that. For example, I'm, you know, to take it to the CrossFit side of things, I feel like there's maybe that like new person who like walks into class and like bar muscle ups are written and they see somebody do it and they walk over the bar and they just like jump up and do a bar muscle up for the first time. And you know, the first attempt they're able to make it or like after like one or two, they're able to do it. And then they're able to string like three together by the end of the session. I feel like that's able to be like really frustrating, but then it's also something that you just need to understand the person's background is what's allowing them to do that. Right. And if you didn't have that same background, you can't expect to do that. Right. I was probably the type of person who walked in and I attempted muscle ups a few times and then I got one. And within, you know, two weeks I was doing 30 for time. And by no means were they pretty or super cleaned up, but I was able to kind of, you know, muscle my way through it, so to speak. And that was just because I had done like 10 by 10 strict pulls for like five years in wrestling. And I was like, I had the, all the prerequisites I needed, right? Whereas a lot of other people, even though they're developing the skill and they're working on that for a while, they don't have all that background or prerequisites that are maybe necessary, right? So it's just something where you need to be aware of that, right? A gymnast is going to be able to come in and likely learn how to handstand walk or go over a ramp or stairs or something like that way quicker than someone who doesn't have that background. So I think you just need to be aware of that. And then also understand that that's going to impact the way that you learn novel movements. And that's like certainly one of the skills that is going to be necessary, right? A novel movements released a few days to maybe a few hours before an event. And people have to learn it, right? Like we saw this in like 2015 at the games with pegboards. We saw this uh, even like, okay, like you might've might gotten hints at this before that, but uh, we saw like crossovers at jump rope in like recent seasons. We saw bar pull outers in 2023. Like a lot of athletes had maybe done them like once or twice, maybe even never. And now they're asked to like string like 16 in a row. And a lot of the athletes did it unbroken with, you know, maybe having a few hours, a few days to like kind of like have a hint at that, that they might be showing up. So Understanding that that's super important, like this is a skill that needs to be trained is important. Also see here, I would say like, as I'm kind of thinking about this first part with this like accelerated time to proficiency in a new skill, this is largely talking about uh, skills that are sort of, again, within CrossFit that are sort of like a binary result, right? It's like either you did it or you didn't. Like, did you do your muscle up or did you not, right? And those can be really challenging for people. Like, did the rope go under your feet twice or did it not? Like, you either did a double under or you did not. Whereas like something like rowing, right? Again, this needs to be measurable within CrossFit. So it needs to be like standards around like what consists of a rep, what does not, right? What is a rep? What is a no rep? And there, that's not the way everything works in CrossFit. Like the ergs are a good example. It's like we're measuring output. It doesn't really matter what you look like when you're actually on the rower, on the biker, on the ski erg. What matters is what's showing up on, you know, the, the machine screen in terms of like measuring your bodily output. So very few things are like that in terms of like most of the things people are learning are either like weightlifting, gymnastics, there's very little cyclical. Most of that stuff is like, you know, like an obstacle course or something along those lines. You could probably define that like probably more into like the gymnastics category than like monostructural. 
just by like the nature of like what what is like required to be successful with that sort of thing. So most of them are gonna have that sort of binary result and that's something that's gonna be almost necessary within CrossFit and also something that athletes just sort of have to be okay with and getting to the point where they're proficient enough to be able to get a few of those reps and be able to start to accumulate some good practice where now they can, as they go about doing those reps, start to refine how they actually do it, which is then gonna snowball us into part two. And like really for me, like as I think about this for an athlete, there's sort of three different factors that would be going into like the time it takes someone to acquire a new skill going from zero to one. It would be like the time per session that they're actually like dedicating to this, the frequency of the sessions, and then sort of like the urgency of their practice. So how long are they actually practicing? How often are they practicing? And how badly do they need to get this skill? Again, for a lot of like quarterfinals athletes who didn't necessarily like the amount of like saw crossover double under the games were like, oh, this is cheesy and it's never going to come out out or like they only practice the double under version and they're asked to do single under crossover single unders at quarterfinals. And now everyone's kind of scrambling to try to figure it out. The urgency of that practice would be really high, even if they don't have as much like frequency or like uh, in terms of like being able to spread that out over like several sessions, it's going to be like condensed. They get a few opportunities to practice urgency is really high. And that's one of those things that pressure can be a good thing. It often allows people to be a little bit quicker than they otherwise would be in terms of learning a new skill. So the time, how often, or sorry, uh, how long, how often, and then like, what is the sort of like pressure of the situation based on like when you're actually going to be asked to do this, or are you not asked to do it? And then it's going to be lower pr pressure. Uh, so that's like your first sort of a, a factor is like how much like urgency and like, what does your practice actually consist of? And then two is like, how many other skills have you actually mastered that have very similar qualities to it? So for example, if you've done um, handstand walking, you've done pirouettes, you've done static holds, and you have uh, are really good at like parallel handstand pushups, the ability to do freestanding handstand pushups is way higher versus if someone just has done handstand walking and they go to try to freestanding handstand pushup. It's going to be way harder for them, right? So developing other skills that are going to have carryover to that skill and the how how many of those things that you've developed and how refined those things are. So it's going to allow you to learn a new skill that's sort of related in the same vein quicker. Again, that's the example of like the gymnast that I gave before. Like, okay, maybe they haven't actually gone over a handstand walk ramp, but they've spent all these variations of skills and tumbling and all this uh, body orientation changes and things that have allowed them to get to the point where they can try something new and have success in it rapidly in that similar category of thing. Uh, and then three, I would say, who you're actually alongside as you go about practicing. So if you are on your own in isolation, if you have no resources along with you, it's going to take you way longer to learn a new skill versus if you have other athletes who um, are just like alongside you and you can kind of go back and forth and have like a dialogue with as you're learning something and sort of like share your, your learnings as you go about doing it. So sort of that like peer interaction. If you have a, a coach who would understand the movement and like motor learning principles and um, those sorts of things where like you have that coach athlete relationship. And then also you could have somebody who's like kind of acting as a coach who's like a specialist. So for example, they might be a gymnastic specialist or a weightlifting specialist, and they might be able to help uh, shed some additional insights or potentially like teach it in a way if they've taught that a similar movement or that movement to a lot of other people, they can obviously teach it to you in a way that could help accelerate your learning in that thing. Now, Ideally, the more of those things you have, like if you have great training partners, you have a great coaching relationship, and maybe your coach can also bring in an expert or a specialist or someone who has better understanding than they do of, of whatever the like niche thing is, that's only going to accelerate your learning in that thing. So again, the more of those things you can leverage and kind of bring into your, your sphere of like just like your daily practice in, in terms of like going about your training, like the more you're going to develop those skills. So again, Three factors. One would be like time, frequency, urgency, like making sure you're getting enough practice that it's in quality bouts and that you, if needed, put some pressure on yourself in a positive way. How many other skills that you've, you've mastered that are very similar to that skill? And then three, who you're actually alongside as you go about learning the work. So that's sort of like going from zero to one. Now let's go to the second part, which is again, taking whatever skill that you've recently acquired and cleaning it up. So basically accelerated time to mastery in this newly acquired skill. So your ability to, to 
again, take whatever you're doing and drive qualities of efficiency and economy into it now. So here we're talking about a skill that we take from being sort of able to do that's highly inefficient, that would break down quickly if you're asked to do multiple things that you're maybe not breathing efficiently in. And now you're basically like pushing all these qualities of efficiency into it. So you're being smooth with your movement so that you can serve how much energy and like contraction you're actually using in that being methodical in how you go about it. Again, just trying to minimize the amount of tension that's actually required to have a successful rep in whatever the thing is. And those two are like really like, again, if I talk about like efficiency, it's like making it as clean as, as possible, whereas like economy is like driving the, the cost per each of those reps down, um, like metabolic costs. So I think this is probably going to be more practical if I just give you guys an example. So like, let, let's use like a, a butterfly chest to bar pull up would be a good example. If you watch like an athlete from like profile from the side and you're watching their shoulder draw like the, this shape as they're going through like a, a, what would ideally be more of like an O pattern with the shoulder. If you watch them from the side, a lot of athletes as they're learning will kind of come up to the bar, they'll smack it and drop straight down. So they kind of draw like the letter D if you're watching the shoulder go through space. So like, how do we get them to move from like that inefficient D-shaped kip to that nice efficient O-shaped where they're able to basically continually redirect their momentum and keep that movement again, really clean and crisp. So obviously there's gonna be a lot of things that they could potentially clean up and that could be wrong with their movement. Um, but like learning some of the, the things that are just gonna be good like cues to think about that are going to again just sort of like generally start to clean up the movement. It's like, okay, how about they learn, start to learn to pull through the plane of the bar rather than sort of hit and smack, make sure they get their height with their shoulder early enough that they can then pull through the plane of the bar and allows them to, uh, again, create more of the O shape versus the, the letter D shape. And that they're really not smacking and falling, rather they're able to, again, move through that plane and sort of catch smoothly at the bottom versus, again, like a jerk or a fall out of the bottom of the rep. Um, they learn to, as they're coming up with their feet through the kipping portion, where they're sort of like doing that half toes to bar kite kip in the in the chest to bar butterfly pull up. They learn to stop their feet more abruptly versus sort of letting them bleed. And that quick, abrupt stop of the feet is going to pop up the hips. And popping up the hips is going to allow them to get, again, more height with the shoulders and torso so that they can fall through the plane of the bar even more comfortably um, and not have to, again, smack the bar up because they're continuing to rise up late in that rep, right? Getting more hip hop, more height early in the rep so they can fall through a little bit easier. Um, they can learn to allow their their body to, again, as I said, like kind of fall through the rep, but then not also like carry a lot of bicep tension as they're in the eccentric lowering uh, portion of that, right? So minimize the amount of bicep tension that they actually need. Again, for like all of those things, I could go on and on with that. It's like, so if that person can slowly start to pay attention to those tiny details and really start to clean up their movement, it's going to allow them to be able to express their capacity basically their ceiling of fitness, they're going to be able to bring that movement way up to that ceiling, right? So if they're, if you think about like their maximal pulling power, their aerobic capacity, their um, tissue tolerance to go through high reps, now we're able to bring all that capacity up towards that ceiling so they can express higher on a test. Because again, they're going to be asked to do probably, you know, 50, 75, 100 chest bars in a workout. Now they're way more efficient so that they can have that that functional ceiling, so to speak, kind of go up towards their actually capacity based uh, ceiling. So in summary, thinking about how we can take a skill from zero to one and improve that. Um, and then once we've actually gotten that sort of initial success with it, now let's push the efficiency side of things and take that skill that you've sort of newly learned and take it from, again, a rough sort of success to a polished um, acquired skill that is really sort of, uh, again, sort of chasing the mastery side of things. So those are sort of like be my big picture things about how I would think about that and how you could sort of structure some of your practice. Again, if you want more like specific details back around that, I would go back to episode number 57 and listen to that. Um, next episode, 
I'm going to release this shortly, but uh, basically it's going to go into uh, a lot more practicals with this. Like what am I actually driving forward with the athletes that I'm, I'm working on in terms of like what specific things are we working on in right now? It's like the 2023 season. Like what things are we working on? How does that change cycle to cycle? And then practical examples of how that would work. So stay tuned for next time. Thanks for listening today. If you're someone who just started listening to the show, I would encourage you to subscribe so you can stay up to date. If you're someone who's been listening for a while, I would encourage you to rate and review the show. And lastly, the best thing that you can do to support our work is also the best thing that you can do for your performance. And that is by hiring one of our coaches. Until next time, stay the course.